getting your home on wheels ready to travel can be a lot of work and we make sure that we don't miss a thing by using checklists. Yeah, we've used checklists since the very beginning and we still use them every single time because guess what? You're outside, you're doing stuff, you get distracted, you might forget something. So having a checklist is imperative. You've probably seen a video that we did like this years ago where we showed our camp breakdown, our camp setup, all in one video, and it was very long. <laughs> it was like 45, 50 minutes. So we're gonna <laughs> spare you that this time. We're really wanting to cover the camp breakdown, uh, get ready to travel process, because that's the most critical, right? We basically break our checklists into four separate checklists to make it a little bit easier on ourselves. So we've got a T24, T12, T1, and T0, that all comes from his Navy background. <laughs> yeah, it really more is uh, like, you know, when you have a launch countdown, you know, T minus 24 hours, blah, blah, blah. So that's where that comes from. And these time frames aren't firm. They're just kind of guidelines. So T24 is like the morning before travel. T12 is the night before travel. T1 is when we get up in the morning, the day of travel. And T0 is go time. That's the final checklist. Basically hitching. We share these lists with each other. We work on them simultaneously. Sometimes some of the things that we do and we check off can be on multiple lists just to make sure we don't forget some things. Also, you're gonna see us using this iPad and our iPhones for these checklists. We just use Apple Notes for these checklists. Apple Notes has a feature in there where it actually includes little check marks where you can check them off, go back later, wipe them out, and reuse them. Now, I don't know what people on Android can use. I'm honestly not sure what's available. I'm sure there are some apps out there that will let you share checklists. Whatever you use, please put it in the comments down below if you're on Android because we don't know and other people might be looking for that. True. We're gonna jump right into it. We're gonna start with T24 and some of the things that he does outside. The first thing I wanna do the morning before is check the rigs and trucks tires for inflation and general inspection. I wanna do this in the morning before the sun comes up because that's how you're supposed to check your tires cold. Now, I'm not gonna get into tire pressures and what we use, just whatever you use for yours, you wanna check those. Now, for us, this check is really easy because I just fire up our TPMS, let it detect all of our tires, I go through the list, and I make adjustments as necessary. I check the inflation, I do a visual inspection on them. I look for anything obvious in the tires, any cracks, any weird wear on the treads. I also get up under and usually with a mirror and I'll check the brakes, make sure the brake lines don't have like hydraulic fluid on them. Just looking for anything obviously out of place here. Of course, I also inspect the suspension parts. Again, looking for anything obvious. Uh, we have the Moride independent suspension, so I check the big rubber thing that is our shocks and I make sure that there's no cracks, no wearing or anything going on there. If somebody has the regular axles instead of the independent suspension, what would they look for? But we used to have that, and I, again, look for anything obvious, but on a regular suspension, you're gonna have hangers and leaf springs. Um, hopefully, if you've got a broken leaf spring, you've already found that, <laughs> but uh, you look for anything odd. You wanna look and make sure your uh, hangers aren't flipped upside down, everything's in the right position. Just inspect, make sure nothing's falling apart down there. Next up on the list is to dump and flush the rear black tank. Our RV has two black tanks and two gray tanks. Three of those, two gray and one black is up front, but the one in the back is all by itself. Now, I don't always hook this up simultaneously. I've got a Y connector for that, so I can actually hook the front and back up if we're gonna be somewhere a long time. But we don't use the back as much, and I also don't dump that every single time we move, if we're on like a 10-day cycle, because it just doesn't get used that much. And it actually has been great. It hasn't smelled even if it has been used because mm -hmm. of the new, um, what's it called? Liquefied. Liquefied <laughs> that we've been using, and then it was, what was it the, that one time where you were waiting for me to to mention <laughs> yeah. have you flushed the black or the back black tank in a while he mm -hmm. was doing a test like kind of an I internal was, test in his mind well, i was doing a little scientific test on tara because <laughs> i but, got a nose that picks things up yeah really really easily we used happy camper for our first five or six years and loved it and it worked really well but it, it after about a week tara would be like don't oh, need to retreat it you know or mm -hmm. need to dump it or whatever and i gotta say that stuff makes him sneeze like crazy so i always felt really bad so i started putting the happy camper in 
because you were getting a lot of sneezing <laughs> yeah. fits and stuff. So yeah, uh, several months ago we switched to Liquefied, which is a formulation that Matt from Matt's RV Reviews, link to his channel down below, uh, came up with and asked us to try it out. And let me tell you, it's great for a couple of reasons. Number one, it doesn't, it's not powder like the Happy Camper is, because that stuff you have to to get it to work right. You've got to sprinkle it in, and that generates a lot of dust. And I would breathe it, and I would sneeze like crazy. <laughs> Also, the liquefied is super easy. It has a self-monitoring uh, little cup on top. You squeeze it in, you dump it in, you're done. But even better than all that is, I've had I've gone three to four weeks in this black tank in the back, and she and hasn't said noticed. she hasn't said a word. So it does really really well on tamping down the smell. And we've used it for like he said for for months and months. You know, mm -hmm. we like to test things out before we share them with you guys. So. Yeah, link to that down below. We really really like it. I know that wasn't on your list, but I wanted to mention it. Yeah, yeah, definitely for sure. And if you're wondering about our process for dumping the tank, we have a whole separate video on that. But the gist of it is, I will run the flush line through the tank for about 20 minutes or until I see clear water. I will then close the valve and let the flush fill the black tank. Now this is when you definitely want to set a timer because if you let that fill overflow, you'll have big, big problems. Set a timer for 10 minutes. Big smelly problems. So I set a timer, I go out and I pull the handle, let it dump until it's dry. And then I turn the flush back on to get some spray on the bottom of an empty tank and get anything else out of there. And then I just repeat this cycle until I don't see anything but clear water. Then of course I stow the rear hose away. Usually it's just a matter of moving one hose to another. Sometimes I hook up the other hose, but either way I make sure the back is secured and ready to go. And then I treat the rear black tank back to the liquefied stuff. That's what I use now. The next step is to dump and flush the front black tank. Same process, same things except I will also dump the gray tanks after to flush the line out. And on Daisy's checklist is just to look cute and be annoying. Oh. Because <laughs> she, she sees out. us yeah, moving she, around doing yeah. stuff. She thinks we're going to leave her or I something. I know. Dogs, dogs get scared like that. Mm -hmm. Of course, then I put all the sewer hoses away completely for the front, and then it's time to inspect the hitch. So I will look at this. I will make sure that I still have my cotter pins retained down in there on both sides. That's what actually holds this head on. Uh, I'll just kind of inspect the bolts all the way around, make sure these are still fastened down and locked in. I will take a little bit of this white lithium grease. And about once every three months or so, depending on how much we're traveling, I will also grease via the Zerk fitting there. I do have a, uh, a grease gun for that. I will also at this time fill our fresh water tank to make sure we've got fresh water for travel days. So again, this is gonna be dependent on what we've got coming up. If we've got a two day travel day, I might put 60 or 80 gallons in there. Again, way more than we need, but just in case. If it's a short travel day, I may just have like 50 gallons. And you know, 50 gallons might seem like a lot, but we found that when you're traveling, especially when you have two fresh tanks like we do and they equalize, we don't want the water to get so low that the water starts, that the water pump starts um, sputtering with air and stuff. So we make sure it's plenty full. Also, if possible, I will dump what fresh water is currently in there before I fill it just to make sure it's all fresh and hasn't been in the tank for like months. Oh. The other thing I do on T24 is I check our walkie talkies to make sure they are charged and then I charge them if not because there's nothing worse than getting to your next site, breaking out your walkies, and they're dead. It always happens when it's a tough site to get into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in the rain. The last thing on my T24 list is I will fuel the truck, again, depending on our travel, what's coming up. If I've got more than half a tank and we've got a short day, or we're along a lot of interstate travel and we're going to have plenty of fuel, I don't worry about it. But if we're out in the boonies, like up in Colorado or something, I make sure that tank is full when we start the next morning. He's doing all his T24 stuff outside. I am doing all of my things inside. What I do for T24 really depends on what our travel day looks like the following morning. So do we have to leave super early in the morning, like first thing, get up and go? Or can we kind of wait until 10 or 11 before we have to pull out? So that will determine how much I do at night. But what I always do the night before is get some things done like pack Daisy's food and her treats and 
our snack bag. And also, if we have several travel days coming up in a row, I'll make a big batch of something for us to eat, like a big batch of chili or a chicken tortilla soup or some kind of stew or something that is large batch that I know for the next couple nights we can have that to eat. I also think about where we're going next. Is the next stop full hookups? Or does it have maybe just water and electric only, no sewer? If there's no sewer hookups at the next stop, I also make sure that I do all of the laundry that we're going to need because I know that we're gonna be on limited resources. And this ties back to some of my T24 stuff also because if I know she's doing laundry or we're gonna take showers the night before travel or whatever, I leave the, the uh, front black tank hooked up so we can dump our gray in the morning before we leave. Mm -hmm. But again, if we're leaving early, early in the morning, I might put it all away. Yeah, I fill up a big water pitcher with water that has been filtered, you know, so something that came right from the city water connection through our filtration system and right through the sink into our Berkey, into the pitcher prior to um, him filling up the fresh water tank. I also empty all the trash inside the RV. So the I've got a couple of trash cans in the bathroom area, one you know under the sink, and then there is a small trash can in the back bathroom. That one hardly ever gets used, so no big deal there. So that's pretty much all of the morning T24 stuff. Again, some of these things are gonna shift. So next up is T12, and this is the, the night before. Again, kind of in stages, getting ready for travel. I secure all the outside items. I put away our e-bikes, uh, or we keep our e-bikes in the back seat of the truck. I put away any camping chairs, our solo stove. I pull in the awnings. I put away our drop shade. Again, just get all the outside stuff stowed. I also take this opportunity to get up on the roof and just do a general inspection, make sure nothing crazy, no branches have fallen, anything big up there I get off of there. If we don't need it, I will pull our Starlink antenna down the night before, that way just get that done and out of the way. Sometimes if Starlink is our only internet option and we're not leaving early the next morning, I just leave it up and do it on T1, which we're gonna get to. <laughs> This is also the time before we start tucking away all the office stuff that I will take our Garmin GPS. I will make sure that the firmware, the operating system, and the maps are all up to date. They're all free with Garmin, which is really, really cool. I will also take this time to go into RV Trip Wizard, kind of compare our route in our GPS compared to Trip Wizard. I'll look at our route and see if there are fuel stops on the way, if there are rest areas, kind of get an idea where we're gonna stop for lunch and things like that. And once all of that is done, I'm pretty much done with the office, it's time to start securing that stuff. Of course, one thing I do is I shut down our network attached storage because you don't want that on while traveling. Most people aren't gonna have a NAS or network attached, attached storage in their RV, but we do. If you've got a computer set up or you work from the road and you have a NAS, shut it down before you travel. Next, I will stow our desks. You'll see in here that Everything on the desk pretty much stays there. Tara puts away her keyboard and mouse and all that and gets all the loose stuff off the desk. I get all my loose stuff off, but the monitors stay on. I just wrap them in a blanket and we put them up next to, kind of touching the top bunk there, but not like holding the bunk up. You see, I wrap them in blankets so they don't get beat up. I also will pin them. I actually uh, drilled some holes and bought some pins just in case anything happens while we're traveling and the Happy Jack system fails and the desks want to fall, they're only gonna fall a few inches instead of onto the motorcycle. I take all the loose gear and stuff that we just kind of have laying around, like our box of drives and things like that. Those get tucked into the rear bathroom and kind of wrapped up and kind of secure. And I close all that in there, shut the light off and all that stuff is done and the floor is clear. So now that everything is cleared off the floor and the garage is ready, it's time to prep the area for Lucille. Lucille is our 2017 Indian Roadmaster, if you're not aware. So I found two a little thick mats that are kind of a little bit sticky, not sticky, but they're grippy on the bottom and the top. I have one for the front wheel, one for the back wheel. I lay those out. We use a wheel dock to actually as our wheel chalk for the, for the motorcycle. I get that down on the front one and then I secure it to three different tie downs, left, right, and front, so that that wheel dock isn't gonna move anywhere. And of course, that means the motorcycle shouldn't be moving anywhere. Uh, I then basically take all of the tie downs, which there are six more tie downs, four for the back, two for the front, that I will just kind of lay out and have them in place and ready. And that basically gets the garage ready to load Lucille. Now, loading the motorcycle, I will do, again, depending on our travel day the next day. If we are leaving super, super early, 
we load the motorcycle right then on T12. If we can. If we can. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we can't because we're in a back in sight and it's not convenient. Sometimes we'll actually pull out a little bit, yeah. load the motorcycle and back it back in. If we know we're leaving super early and mm -hmm. we don't want to disturb our neighbors with a loud motorcycle yeah. firing up at like six or seven in the morning, mm -hmm. then we will we will go the extra, make the extra effort to pull out of the site and get her in there. Yeah, it's a pain, but it's, mm -hmm. it's worth it to have it done for us and also to be respectful to our neighbors. Yeah. If we're in a pull through site, easy peasy. You just drop the ramp and pull it in. Let me show you what we got. Two straps back here. This one will help pull the bike back, keep it back. Of course, just lateral stability there. Same on this side. Up here, the fork strap is normal. Had that all along. I added this strap here to stop or prevent the uh, wheel dock from sliding left to right. And then this one stops the wheel dock and the whole bike from sliding that way, of course. So I think we're pretty solid here. She's not going anywhere. The other thing on the checklist back there is I will take our patio doors, which are glass. Uh, Lippert says you should have those lowered so they don't slide down or shake loose and slide down and break in the middle of your travel. I put all of those down and then because it's all open back there at that point, I usually close up our patio. I secure the patio rails, I close the door and just secure it until I'm ready to load the seal the next morning. Next up is snacks. <laughs> Gotta have travel snacks. Gotta have travel snacks. So I pack a snack bag with anything we might have in the pantry that I think I'm gonna want to eat or he's gonna want to eat. Cheez Its. I, I also get, yeah, I also get stuff for little Miss Daisy ready to go, her treats and, and her food and, and all of that stuff. And then once I get the snacks all packed up and ready, then I put the tension rods up in the pantry for each shelf. I do that the night before usually because it's not really in the way. You can still get the stuff in there. Mm. It's pretty simple. Just stop stuff from falling off shelves. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's just, again, it's just preventative. And that way, when you open the pantry after a long day of travel and you forget that you've traveled and stuff doesn't come flying out at you, hopefully. I also roll up all the rugs because again, you can't have the rugs down and put the slides in. <laughs> that would be that would be bad news. Make sure all of those are rolled up and stored. This is when everything starts to get packed up and, and put away. I can't put everything on the bed yet because obviously we still have to sleep, but a lot of times I will get stuff moved into the bedroom so that the next morning I can just easily put everything on the bed. I pack up anything off of the countertops that may fall. Mm -hmm. Everything. So the utensil caddies, the knife, the knife holders over here, the coffee maker stays put because we need that for the morning. The Berkey usually stays out as well because we want to fill up our waters before we go. If we are done eating for the night, then I will also move the dinette chairs around the way that they are going to need to be placed for traveling, which is two of them on one side, right? So that there is space to move this chase over. The stools here, one of them gets actually laid on the dinette chairs. The other one's gonna just get placed on the bed. So that, that happens in the morning. So everything here in this living room, I've got two large floor lamps. I've got a plant here. I've got baskets, all the knickknacks, everything has a place. And if you're wondering, these little plants that are hanging over here mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> from a thing, they're they just, they stay there. They don't go anywhere. They just, yep. they, they probably swing. They oh. probably swing and maybe we may regret that someday because <laughs> the, the plant holders are ceramic, but whatever. If we've already taken our showers for the night before travel, then I can also use the shower as a place to stow things as well. So I will do that. That includes the little cabinet in the loo, in the little toilet room. I pick that up and I put that in the shower. And that's it. Then we're ready to sleep and... Checklist. Sleep is on the checklist. Sleep. Well, it's sleep's not. always on the checklist. It's <laughs> on my permanent checklist. So on T1, the morning of... Coffee. Thing, 
<laughs> yeah, after after we get coffee and wake up in the garage uh, I secure all antennas make sure the Starlink is put away if I didn't put it away the night before I take the storage cabinet after Tara has put away some of her things in there like the the Berkey and the coffee pot go into that cabinet we have in the back I flip the child locks on there so it's not going to pop open during travel I take our Dyson vacuum cleaner and take it off the wall and lay it on the floor with the ladder that stays back there I make sure that the um, the closet doors are secured so the closet washing machine doors have these latches on both sides. I make sure that all the drawers and cabinets in the whole coach I go around and make sure everything is latched, mm -hmm. you know, closed tightly so that they don't come popping open. Put everything that I got up to the bedroom make sure all of that's laying on the bed roll up the rug of course up there anything that's loose on the bed i want to make sure nothing's going to roll uh, roll away fall off make sure the shower door is locked i usually do that at night before we go to sleep just as a once we're done showering i'm just like oh we're done mm -hmm. lock but it's on the but i check it again in the morning just mm -hmm. to make sure and then speaking of doors both of our doors that go into the master bath and then into the bedroom are sliding doors so we make sure that those are latched and secured as well we want to make sure the windows are closed tight i think you've seen it in a previous video where we have almost forgotten it mm -hmm. but because yeah, we check yeah if you don't have them down tight the vibration of travel can loosen them up yeah. a little bit and if those windows that pop open like this yeah. <laughs> uh, pop all the way open and the wind catches them it's it could rip them off or break mm -hmm. them and then the bedroom slide goes in we make sure that the water pump is turned off that the water heater is off. We turn the gas off, but we leave the electric on. You're gonna have a couple of items here that we talk about that are electric related that are gonna be different for us because we have this Volta power system that can run everything while we travel. Separate video coming on that, so we're not gonna get into we're it. Getting closer to having that video ready <laughs> yeah. for you. But we leave our water heater on because why not show up with hot water if you can? Turn off all the lights, make sure all the windows in here you said are already closed. We turn all three of our ACs on for travel. Totally different than what most people are going to do, we understand. It's so cool. I love it so much. Yes. We turn all of ours on. The RV is ready to move and load and you go walk Daisy. Yes, that's very important. We need to get some of that, that hyper energy out of her because she gets very stressed. While Tara's walking Daisy, I pull in the main slides and make sure that the main living area is ready for travel. We uh, put the stairs up, put the handrail in, then it's basically I go over and make sure all the stuff gets disconnected. So if I haven't already done the, the, uh, the sewer and stuff that gets put away, I disconnect our water at this time and I also disconnect our shore power and uh, put all the cables and all that stuff away. I also physically turn off our propane. I shut off on the valves just for safety reasons. We have a residential fridge and like we mentioned, everything is powered. So now we're into the hitching. This is when, you know, all this checklist stuff is great and we need it. Make sure we don't miss anything, but this hitching checklist is absolutely critical because if this stuff is missed, things can go really, really wrong. Uh, first on the T0 list is to make sure the T24, T12, and T1 checklists are complete. <laughs> <laughs> so I just make sure we've done everything. Yeah. So once all that is done, I go to what's called tow height on our Lippert auto level system. That brings up the four rear jacks and basically puts the nose back where it was when we came off the hitch. In the truck, I make sure the TPMS is on. I make sure the truck is in tow haul mode. Uh, I extend our mirrors and I put the tailgate down. That's important. <laughs> And then of course I hitch the truck. Again, there's not a checklist for that. You just back in and you hitch it. <laughs> but we do have a separate video on that also. But after I have hitched, I do a physical check of the Kingpin lock bar, make sure it's all the way around. I can physically see it wrapping around. I then pin the uh, hitch lock in. I connect the seven way connector. I connect the emergency brake or breakaway cable and then I connect our Volta power system. A lot of you have seen that in recent videos and asked what that is. Uh, we have a alternator in our truck from Volta that supplies 60 volts at up to like six kilowatts, which is why we can run everything. So I make sure all of that is connected. After it's connected, this part is critical. We do a pull test. We do a pull test every time we hitch, even if we just get off the hitch for a minute, like at a rest stop or something to level for lunch, hitch. Anytime you miss that hitch, you do a pull check. So in this pull test, I basically make sure that the trailer is connected in the system because I want to be using the brake. I make sure the chocks are still on the RV because if the pull test fails, I don't want it rolling down a hill. I put the landing gear in pull check position, which is basically putting the front landing gear about half an inch to an inch off the ground. In case it does come off the hitch during the pull test, 
it'll fall one inch onto those gear, not on the truck. Then I do my pull test and then I set my parking brake on the truck and then it's time to unchock the wheels. And then once all of that is done, I make sure the truck tailgate is closed. I retract all the landing gear, bringing it up from, you know, the one inch off the ground. I turn the lights on in the truck that supplies the voltage to our backup camera or rear view camera, whatever you want to call it, so we can see behind the RV. So then we do a light check. We coordinate that together. Sure so much easier work. now with the lights that you put on. Yeah, they're nice and big. Yeah. Oh, I like that a lot. Oh yeah, you can definitely see that right turn. Yeah, that was pretty cool, huh? Yeah, definitely. Now I see the left. And here comes the brake. Nice. Then I get out and I do a full walk around of the RV. This is done anytime we go from standing still to moving, whether it's at a rest area for fuel or whatever. I do a full walk around. I look at all the windows, make sure they're all closed. I make sure the slides are in and flush. I check the tires. I just do a look for anything out of place. Look up, look down, look around. Anything out of place all the way around the truck and the RV. And then I reset our trip meter so we can track our fuel mileage and then we're ready to roll. There's a whole nother separate list of chores and things that need to be done once you get to your site. But these are the most important to make sure you have a safe travel day. Yeah, essentially if you just take the checklist and flip it upside down, put it reverse, that's the checklist to set up. <laughs> But seriously, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you want to download these checklists, you can click in the description down below. We'll have links to that in the blog post also. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.